Thank you very much for coming out this afternoon to this uh, second of our, our larger uh, installments of the conversation. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge, as is our custom, our presence on the lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, we're grateful to be able to live, to learn, to research, and to play on these lands. So welcome, everyone. Uh, the first of these open sessions as part of the conversation was intended to be a very open discussion about no topic in particular. It was about the state of the university issues that uh, people wished to surface and to talk about. Uh, on that occasion, uh, the, the meeting occurred shortly after the Chown Hall incident. Uh, and so there was uh, a very, uh, I think, robust and helpful discussion about issues of climate, culture, and race on our campus. And a number of other issues came up, uh, particularly uh, issues regarding international students on our campus. And uh, uh, those aspects of, of that first meeting cast us forward to today's event and others. So uh, just to remind you, there's, there's this, um, this session. And then uh, for the remainder of this term on November the 18th at 4 o'clock uh, in graduate studies, there will be another one of these uh, on November the 25th at 5.30. There will be a special uh, AMS assembly. And uh, on that occasion, there will be pizza uh, to, <laughs> to stimulate and augment the discussion. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and then on January the 14th, there will be a session at Duncan MacArthur Hall on West Campus. So the intention is to advance the conversation at every opportunity. Uh, and as I, I, I said when uh, we were at the last of these meetings, I'm using every possible opportunity to talk to members of our university community to, about the issues that uh, bear on our future, the values we want to see animate the work we do here, the impact we want to see uh, this university have in the world, uh, and uh, through this discussion, trying to be very deliberate about some of these, uh, these admittedly somewhat abstract issues, but issues which nevertheless need to be addressed and thought about before we even get close to thinking about what a strategic plan for the university should look like for the next uh, five to 10 years. So today's talk, well, let me just go through some housekeeping things before I get on to those. Um, I just, these are the ground rules for these meetings. Uh, they are set up so that everyone and anyone can contribute to the discussion. That's the point. It's not for me to talk uh, uh, incessantly. It's uh, for us to have a conversation uh, about these questions. Um, if you don't get to express your views on a topic uh, here today in person, you, there's, a, 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 there's the possibility of providing uh, online input uh, through the website, through the principal's office website, and you're welcome to contribute that way. Um, I'm also very open to private meetings to talk about any issues that uh, you'd prefer to talk about in, in that context. Uh, we're videotaping today's recording as we do um, uh, at each of these things, uh, principally for the purpose of making this discussion available to everyone in the university, to people, for example, who weren't able to make it here. And they, these recordings also provide a means by which uh, I and my team can be reminded of the way in which uh, topics have come up for conversation. Uh, and because we're recording it, it's important when you speak, please, to use the mic, uh, obviously, so that we can all hear, but also so that you can be heard on the recording. Um, so um, I'm going to just set the scene, if I may. So. Uh, I mean, ridiculous, it's an hour-long meeting and we're going to talk about the, perhaps the two biggest issues that face our university, one research and the other internationalization. Uh, they are closely related, of course, because they bear together on another big issue, which is our reputation as an institution. Uh, and it, whether we like it or not, the, in, in this day and age, universities are global entities. They have to have an impact. In a global context, they have to be players in, on the international stage. And so for that reason, it's obviously critical that we think about what Queen's international engagement should look like, what the principles are on which we should conduct ourselves uh, in relations with institutions and, and students and researchers abroad. So th that is, that is a, a critical um, 
issue for us to settle because, of course, international is not just a thing that happens to one side of the university. And my, my view is that it's fundamental to the success of any university nowadays and getting it right and getting it right in a way that's properly integrated in the life of the academic life of the university and ethically defensible and sustainable in the context of those, those uh, academic values is critically important. So international, yes, uh, it does raise a series of specific questions that may bear on student mobility or research collaborations or whatever, um, but uh, uh, very obviously very closely connected to uh, our rep uh, every uh, 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 university's reputation seen from uh, every other point of view. And then there's the issue of research. So, uh, so I've, I've been back at Mac for five years. Uh, I'll offer you the observation that when I first came to Mac in 2005, our level of sponsored research was approximately where it is right now. So that's 15 years later. Um, if, as measured by those gross research dollars coming in, we appear, we're doing okay. If you look at the research intensity figures, we're doing okay. But I am aware that there is um, a, a sort of crisis of confidence in the university about our research standing. Uh, and I think it'd be important to talk about that and to talk about um, what components of that issue are circumstantial, where we are geographically, how much access we have to major uh, health clinical and research facilities, because that is one of the, uh, I think, differentiators between us and some of the universities that uh, 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 have much higher levels of, of uh, research revenues. And then how much of it is cultural? What are we not doing? What is its relationship, for example, to our rate of faculty hiring? So we've just embarked on a faculty renewal initiative to bring 200 faculty members into the university over five years bound to have, I hope, if the hires are good, an impact on our research productivity. Um, but that is one of a number of factors. So I'm interested in talking to you about, about all of those. Um, now, some of you will be aware of the research info source figures that just came out about three days ago. And so just, this is the last bit of context I'll provide before asking for your thoughts about these things. Um, uh, Queen's dropped two places in the national research rankings in terms of gross research dollars coming in. We dropped from 11th, where we were last year, and that's based on 2017 data, to 13th. So 13th out of the 15 research intensive universities in the country. Um, what was behind that? A 15% drop in research income in that year. Now, I know from talking to uh, Vice Principal Woodhouse, the, that, is, that can be accounted for almost entirely by fluctuations in clinical trials funding. And that's perfectly understandable. You know, Calgary went up by 40 million a couple of years ago and looked fabulous, but it was just a particular set of clinical trials. So that, you know, one has to look at this not in an alarmist way, but uh, however, it, that still means we're sort of fluctuating and, fluctuating and vulnerable around the sort of 170 million dollar mark for sponsored research. So that loss was a, approximately a 30 million dollar loss in research revenues to the university um, that clinical trials hit. So it's the largest drop in the U15. And if we're thinking about where this institution stands or should stand on the national scene, that is an important thing to think about. Um, um, we don't want to be 15th out of 15. In, in the U15. Um, now, positively, if you look at the figures, um, we're actually quite good on the f research intensity side. So the average research dollars brought in by eligible faculty members here uh, in that year is 226,000, approximately. Um, it's pretty respectable. UBC is 261, Alberta's 235, Western is 171. So um, here again, uh, I don't want to sort of be appearing to sort of to be overly worried about this because I think it's a, it's a respectable uh, figure. On the other hand, University of Toronto, 407,000 on average. 
uh, McGill 321, and McMaster 439 uh, on average. So now here we go to the contextual thing. Um, institutions with access to the university health network, of course, you're going to have a high average. Universities which are with a higher concentration in the sciences and biomedical sciences, like Mac than we are, will have a higher figure. And that's circumstantial, and it's not necessarily something we should worry too much about. But it is true that we need to think seriously about uh, the enterprise of research here. The, you know, the horse has left the gate. We are a research-intensive university. We will be ranked. We will be assessed next to those uh, uh, other research-intensive institutions. And uh, we need to therefore be thoughtful about how we uh, improve our performance uh, uh, on that front. And as I say, that is, of course, profoundly connected to the issue of our global standing. So if you look at the academic ranking of world universities, it's research data and bibliometrics that earn your place in, in the uh, ARWU rankings. Uh, similarly, with the Times Higher, you know, the significant global rankings are, <clears throat> they, don't, they don't have kind of mysterious methodologies. You can agree with the methodologies or not, but they are based, some of them, heavily on public, uh, publicly accessible uh, research data and bibliometrics. So, um, those are my, my uh, sort of opening contextual comments, and I hope they haven't sort of set a gloomy tone for the discussion. Um, I, I, I am actually very excited about where we can go at Queen's on both of these fronts. Um, uh, but in order to, to chart a clear course, we need to talk about what we want from the, for the university in terms of research or in, in terms of international. So can I, can I just leave it there and, and see how you would like to take the conversation and uh, give me your thoughts about either of those topics? I'll say we'll pick both of these topics up repeat, re repeatedly in future ones. Yes, please. Thanks, Susie. I don't know if I need the microphone. I have a naturally loud voice. Just for the good of the okay, video. For the, for the recording. OK. Um, First of all, thank you for holding this session. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of voice some of two things that I've observed as a relatively new faculty, a relatively junior person. Um, when, when I first arrived, I arrived here in um, 2015 and had two children in, in that time. Um, so I wouldn't add up all those years uh, as if they were full years. Um, but I, I think there's two main things that I think were not tied to our geography or our limitations that I think could have supported me further. So when I first arrived in, within the first few months, I, I got my first grant as a principal investigator uh, in the strategy for patient-oriented research. By any metrics, that's, a, that's extremely, um, th that's great. <laughs> um, but I learned very quickly that one of my biggest challenges was going to be that there was no mechanism for, uh, for my administrative supporters or not to, to help me leverage my research su success into more research success. Right, so, so the workload agreement was the same workload agreement for everybody, no matter how successful or productive that they were. So I have to say that as a junior faculty member, um, that, that can be a little frustrating. Now I'm not turned off, I'm not gonna start, I'm not gonna put my, take my foot off the gas, but there's hiring new faculty and then there's make, setting them up for success when they get here. So, so I would say making sure that there's a mechanism for those who are productive productive, who are willing, who, who can demonstrate a track record, who can grow their program, make sure that you um, support them in, into doing more of the same and then reward them when they do. So, so that would be the first thing. Thanks. Um, the second thing had to do with um, some collaborations that could have, that if I was able to, if they were more formalized, um, if there was more um, administrative support for collaborations, um, then I, it would have been easier for me to not have to pound the pavement. Now my area is health sciences, specifically rehabilitation, and I have to do a lot more work um, that t detracts from my research to set up partnerships with clinicians and providers. And, and I think that if 
if those partnerships were more formalized at a higher level, it would be easier um, for those people to work for, with me and for me to work with them. We're not having difficulty working with one another because we're bad people or because we don't want to, be, but because it's not part of our jobs and that makes it very difficult for us to do things together. Yeah. So those are kind of the two elements that I'd say are something we could actually do something about. They're our problems, they're not, yeah. they're yeah. not anything. Uh, th thanks. Both re re really important points. Uh, particularly the, the latter point, I think there are many aspects of the university's operations that could benefit from a more targeted uh, capacity for, for finding relationships and building them so that the individuals who, who are doing research, say, or trying to teach a course which has an experiential learning component don't have to do the basic work of identifying the partners. So I, I think that's, that's a really good point. When, um, when you talk about collaboration, you're talking about, I mean, I took you to mean collaboration largely with parties outside of the university. Is it also a problem internally? Um, no, I'm, I'm thinking of health service providers. Yeah. Who, health service providers who, who, are not, um, who are not given the message from, from their bosses and their managers that, that they're going to be rewarded for, be, for participating in research, that they're detracting from patient right. care, for example, when they, um, when they do research. Even if we're not draining resources, I'm very mindful of that. I'm a former clinician myself. Um, but just um, if you raise it sometimes higher up, people will, will just be like, oh, and it's kind of the way it is. But yeah. really, it would, it would be great if, if their bosses were re and their managers were rewarding them for working with me. And I also was rewarded for working with them. If we were co-publishing together, if we could find some synergies. Long term, it has an educational benefit too, yeah. right? It's more clinical placements for the students. It's more potential clinics moving forward once we establish the research. Like, there are downstream effects to things besides research, but it's got to start with a little bit of um, input energy to get that catalyst going. Yeah. Thanks. No, I, I, I could provide you more specific. I don't think it necessarily benefits the audience, though, but I just, no. I, I would be happy to discuss oh, it. Oh, thanks. That. No, I appreciate it. I, I actually, I think the whole issue of partnerships. Uh, I mean, obviously, in, in, the, in the health sector, there's a particular form of partnership that's important, but uh, uh, partnerships with industry uh, seem one of the key ways in which you can really grow the level and, and intensity of research on this campus. And also partnerships with other institutions that take us out of our, our, our jurisdiction. This, yeah. this campus has been extraordinarily supportive with the partnerships that I've, I've been trying to develop with industry. Oh. Right. Yeah, the, the, the research office, the, the development office, they've really been helping with that. Good to hear. Thanks. Feel free to comment on the points just raised or, or, or if, if you want to go in a different direction. Yes, David. Kingston's a lovely place, but <laughs> it's difficult to set up international networks and national networks from here. Um, and particularly when you, you want to be the PI on the thing, so we get most of the credit. So I think one of the things that ought to be extraordinarily easy to do here is um, compensate for distance with uh, IT. Sure. Um, I think it should be blazingly simple. There should be a city or a university-wide license for things like Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so that we can all have at our desk the ability to make two clicks and have 30 people on a research gr group from around the world to make it easy to set up meetings, to make it dead easy to uh, see each other and talk to each other on a regular basis and overcome the disadvantage of our, our uh, non-metropolitan location. It's getting easier to do that, and I think this is one of the things that the university ought to specialize in that uh, our IT group helping us with this, particularly as we're starting to get um, criticism about um, uh, researchers tra air, air traveling so yes, much from a sustainability yeah. point of view. It's another reason we've got to get expert at this. And it has uh, a flip over good effect in uh, our teaching in that it should be really easy to get our colleagues from around the country and around the wor world into our classroom. 
um, so that you can have guest lectures from the very best people in the world that we know from our research ne network to make it, again, dead easy to, to drop them into Sterling D, D um, there. So uh, that would be a sort of underlying thing that would help yeah. us uh, compensate for our, our uh, location in this lovely city. I, I like that idea very much. I mean, that it speaks to two things. It speaks to the, the fossil fuel issue, but it also, it's, you know, if you think about it, it, I think it is a very, very elegant solution to the geographical issue. Um, not, not possible in, in earlier times, but now very possible. So thanks, it's a great point. Come, come. Yeah, please. Thank you. I'm Michael White from the, uh, the library. Um, and I just wanted to kind of build on the, the previous uh, statements regarding Zoom. Um, I think we need to take or develop some kind of, of university-wide plan for building our digital communication infrastructure. Um, in addition to like video conferencing software, I think there are a whole range of tools that we should be looking at and integrating into our research. Uh, things like citation managers, of course, uh, but writing tools like Overleaf, which uh, a number of universities now are in incorporating um, and, and allowing their grad students and researchers to, to use to write, mm -hmm. and then also integrated with their institutional repository so that theses are move from the overleaf system right into the institutional repository. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole host of tools that we, we should be looking at to uh, improve managing our uh, research data, uh, electronic notebooks, for example. Um, and I think here at Queens, we tend to look at these things kind of at a faculty level or even a departmental level. So it's kind of piecemeal and yeah. ad hoc. Uh, and so we, I think we should be doing more of an institutional level planning. Yeah, thank you very much. A, a, a great point. I mean, I think very much uh, an extension of David's that, you know, if, if where we can facilitate our research productivity, our research connectivity, and so on through technological means, it makes a lot of sense to do that, of course. Right. Other, other comments? Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Chris Coupland. I'm from undergraduate admission and recruitment. Um, and so that, the, the, the point about the video conferencing, um, that seems to me really interesting when you think about the castle as well. Um, so being experts in that area and, and how can we allow faculty to be able to deliver you know, talks, you know, not just bringing in people here to the Kingston campus, but getting the best um, uh, you know, faculty members to be able to deliver talks at, at the castle. Um, but in more broadly, how how do you think the castle fits in with the whole internationalization of the campus? Uh, so, the, thank you for the question. Um, well, the castle is a unique asset. I mean, th there is no Canadian university that has a similar asset. Uh, and my observation would be, including the five years I was here as VP academic, we haven't quite known what to do with it. So there's the dilemma of, you know, is it, is it Queens and East Sussex? Well, that, that's hard actually to sustain that view because it doesn't have the facilities we have here. There are some subjects that are very difficult to teach there. There are subjects you can teach there that you can't teach here. Um, and I, I mean, my view has always been that it, you have to recognize its difference uh, before you can integrate it. I, I think it's a mistake to assume it's just an extension of us and that we can control it from the mothership. Um, I, I think that's... That's not the case. However, I think it needs to be a cornerstone of our internationalization strategy. It needs to be a place, a sort of a beachhead we have on the other side of the Atlantic, where we not only try to offer a, an exciting, globally informed education, but also where we, we perhaps bring research partnerships together. I mean, we have a number of conferences that occur there every year, which is in keeping with the original conception of the place. But I think we, we're nowhere near making the most of that as an asset. Um, I mean, at the moment, enrollment is down. 
alarmingly down. I mean, it's below 100. And if I remember rightly, uh, the sustainability of the cast was about 150 students in any given term. So that's alarming. And what's also alarming is the students are not particularly international. Um, so, you know, I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of very good thinking going on, on about it at the, at the castle there. But so what's important to me is that we integrate any strategic thinking about Hearst Monsu into our broader strategic thinking about international on, on campus. And I do think we need to be creative. It's, it's an asset we have that at the moment I don't think we're using to full effect. Um, it's become more challenging to do this in the UK, right, before immigration reasons, so that's one reason the numbers are down, I gather. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not always easy for other, part, other institutions to partner with us on sending students there. I mean, I, at, in its initial conception, you remember it was a consortium of various Canadian universities sending students to this place, which we had been fortunate enough to be given. And then, of course, the mystique of Queen's meant that other institutions chose not to send their students there because they lost them. You know, they'd transfer into Queen's. That's what I was told by the U of T president. Um, so that model, though we won an award for it, um, uh, is, is no longer possible. But we do need, we need to really, I think, work on on the international networks that we have that would bring students to the castle so that it could be a truly international place. But we also, I think, need to think beyond it just as a purely place for undergrad education. Um, uh, so I'm not going to presume to say what, what it should look like, but I think, uh, A, we have to integrate it thoroughly. It has to be a cornerstone for what we try to do internationally. And uh, we, cannot be, um, we cannot presume that it will be successful just because it is a queen's operation. You have to work at it. You, know? you have to recruit students. And uh, what, what is on offer there has to be demonstrably not on offer anywhere else. So uh, I think a lot, a, lot, a lot of potential there still. Uh, up there and then Cynthia. Hello. Um, uh, I'm a PhD student in political studies and uh, I'm an international student. So I kind of believe from my observation, uh, international students bring with themselves actually some research topics and uh, kind of endeavor which contributes to internationalization of the yes. research activity as a whole. And uh, one, I think, point that uh, can make an institution more attractive to international students, uh, which kind of produce good quality work or candidates to do so, is their uh, well-being in the place that they want to go to, right? And if we are in a competitive uh, plane with other universities, I think uh, financial well-being is one of them. And uh, uh, PhD students uh, who extend their studies, you know, beyond four years, yes. they are struggling. And when they are str struggling, it's not so easy to, I think, focus on your work or excellence. You do, but it takes longer time and it even makes things worse. So um, I know in next week's uh, principles conversation, it will be the maybe focus of the talk, I don't know, graduate studies yeah. and uh, the challenges that are, uh, uh, we, are, we are facing in that uh, field. But even in the topic of internationalization, it's important because UFT, Western, McMaster, uh, recently Brock, you know, those universities have changed their funding packages and their uh, fee structures for PhD students. Yeah. And if Queen wants to remain competitive and attractive, I think there should be fundamental reforms that, that, that should be done. When you pay $15,000 fees for my you know, program, and if you have to do multiple TA ships and RA ships, and if you write your dissertation at the same time. So research excellence is something also that is put at risk, I guess. Yeah. 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 Th thank you. Uh, very important points. Uh, to some extent, had been raised at the earlier one of these meetings, so 
Um, I, ab absolutely, those, those important questions to be taken seriously and to be, to be looked at. I, I agree with you completely. I would say, by the way, the, uh, the federal government's recent internationalization strategy feels like a terribly lost opportunity to me. I mean, it's actually a small amount of money. I mean, one should always be grateful for what governments put out there, but it is, I mean, 140 some million. And the hope had been that there would be money for Canadian students outgoing to have an international experience and international students to come into the country, both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Uh, what there is now is money to, for universities to look at ways in which incoming students can be supported and so on. So, you know, I mean, institutions can do what those other institutions you, you've mentioned have done, just to remove the differential fee for graduate students at a certain level and so on. Um, and I think that is necessary to do. Uh, the, the problem will always be with us unless there is some kind of big funding source that makes it possible for students from around the world to come here who have the talent uh, and you know, the, the brilliance to succeed in a graduate program, but just not the resources. So yeah, I think we, we, need to, we need to attend to our own policy issues. I think we also have to find money that actually supports that because um, it's hard, hard to describe yourself as an international campus um, when it's, in fact, so difficult for graduate students to, to come and do the work they need to do without being under duress. Uh, Cynthia. Let me also add my thanks to you for hosting this conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to build on your comment about partnerships. And this, in the same spirit as some of my colleagues, these things are, are things that we have control over here at Queen's University. So in, in my role as an associate vice principal of research, I often was told, it's very hard to be partners with Queen's University. We make it very difficult for other people to become our partners internationally or with student exchanges, with research collaborations, with industry. And I was thinking about that a little bit, and I think there are a variety of reasons. One is cultural. We think about ourselves at Queen's, we're very proud of Queen's. We love our university, we think of ourselves as different and special, and so we're very picky about who our partners are going to be. We also have this thing about Queen's that's really unique and wonderful, we're very decentralized. So it's hard when partners come here to know who they need to talk to and yeah. who's in charge and who's making the decisions. And I think the last thing is simply a matter of resources. It takes a lot of effort on the part of people who put those partnerships together to have an opportunity to have sustained interactions. So for example, you can't just go once to one meeting and say, okay, now we're going to be partners. But if yeah. you're going to go to a series of meetings or have a series of conversations, that's going to take a certain amount of time out of whoever is making those partnerships. And we have had a bit of a habit of looking at this as a, a kind of a one-shot thing. Right, so I'll give you some money to go and try and partnership with that, rather than we need a three-year plan in yeah. order to make this yeah. happen. So again, I think that we have an opportunity here to do some things differently and think about how we want that to be in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm so pleased you mentioned that. So I'll say, speaking as a person who is of Queen's, was here, and has been away, that notion of it being an institution that's very difficult to partner with is absolutely true. Um, so I've seen it on the inside, how it works. I've seen the perception from the outside. So uh, a, r a really good point. Uh, similarly, that issue of investing in it, uh, because it, it's, uh, it has to be sustained. And it, this is related to another issue that I think is a problem in the university, and that's the capacity for risk taking. I think you actually have to be prepared to take a risk. You have to be able to gamble more than just one air ticket to northern Italy, and oh, it worked out okay, or no, it didn't. Um, there's got to be more to it, and I think you have to be strategic about where you want partners to go. You have to find some way to get around that decentralized issue, because, you know, it's much easier to have a partnership with an institution or a group of institutions in another country, say, if different constituencies in the university are feeding into it rather than just one unit. So, great point, Cynthia. I, I, you know, it's early in this conversation, but it's, to me, it's, it's such an obvious thing, this, in, in, this issue of partnership and the capacity for partnership as representing one of the key solutions to some of our issues that, that we have. Um, interestingly, I met just uh, last week with the Retirees Association, 
And I asked the same question, you know, what, what's your advice to me? What should we be pursuing? And there was a strong feeling in the room that partnership, getting away from thinking we're so, you know, wonderful and kind of self-sustaining and et cetera, actually reaching out uh, for, to strengthen ourselves through good partnerships. Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. Please. Uh, so I'd like to turn around one of the things that you said at the beginning, that we're not close to UHN or other large uh, areas that we could uh, partner with. We have the unique opportunity that we are, say, 200 kilometers away from any other institution of our size. That gives us a massive catchment of partners. Uh, whether we're talking about small and medium enterprises, we could be talking about uh, smaller health teams, we could be talking about nonprofits, and it all comes down to the collaboration again. So I'd love to know how you could see us leveraging Queens, not from a look at how big and tough we are, but look at how we can sail ahead, break the ice and bring partners along, and what kind of partners you could see us partnering with, whether that's municipalities, uh, not just city of Kingston, but again, stretching out to our neighbors at GAN and, uh, and across. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, a really good suggestion. So there is already discussion underway uh, about Queen's leading a sort of a, a cluster that would sort of run the 401 corridor from Scarborough to Cornwall, say, and then north of that line, bringing in industry, other institutions, municipalities, and so on. So at the end of this month, we're convening MPPs from that whole area at Queen's Park to talk about this. And last week, we had Queen's Day at Queen's Park, and this was a, an issue we presented. I, so, I mean, I, so I've come out of the, the, the Toronto Waterloo supercluster, uh, and of course, I mean, that's a formidable force because just by concentration of industries and institutions, there's a lot of firepower there. And there is a, a, a comparable capacity, not, not a comparable capacity, but uh, something very similar could be done in this eastern corridor. So I think it's a great idea. And, and I, I, I mean, some people would be re reluctant to bring Ottawa into this, but I'm not. I think that actually would be a potentially very strengthening thing to do. Um, but I, I, I like that idea very much. And I think, you know, you look at federal government initiatives, uh, they are all going to, in the future, realistically, they're going to put a premium on partnerships and regional, partnerships for regional enhancement. Uh, so whatever we do, whether it's you know advancing some very specialized field of research or whether it's some some industry contracted research on some new materials, this this can all be integrated in a view that I think would be very persuasive to governments when they're funding too. So great great point, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm reluctant to let this conversation end without making some comment about the revitalization of our internationalization plan here at Queen's in, in the time since you've been gone. Um, and, and more recently, the, the international community or the, the, the culture of internationalization has really suffered a blow at, at uh, Queen's. The International Centre itself was all but dismantled um, by a new reporting structure, and its and its focus has really taken on a different a different way of of uh, supporting the internationalization plan at, at the university. And I'm I'm just aware that you know as we go in as the other as our last internationalization plan has finished, and we'll be thinking about a new one, that we think about developing a new internationalization plan with an internationalization at home mm -hmm. piece to it because not everyone can go abroad and not everyone wants to go abroad and we, and we have a lot of students here but what what are we doing with our our culture here that yeah. makes it a more global community so there's lots of there's lots of ways to unpack that but just to make sure that everyone knows yep. that that's that's something that we need to work on Thanks, Kathy. Well, I, I would not have wanted the session to end without that being said, too. So my observation is that um, we, we do seem to have lost something we had before. We had uh, a structure that was 
highly respected across the country for training international educators. There was a conference every year. Um, and there were individuals within the, 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 the uh, Queen's University International Center who were respected nationally for the work they did on this front. And I, I don't yet understand what has happened, but we are in a very different place. My perception is that our capacity for internationalization on all fronts, at home, through student mobility, through research partnerships and so on, is very scattered. And notwithstanding some good work that has, has been done by, I know, the, for, the former uh, AVP for International, uh, International Affairs. So I'm, I, I'm actually optimistic about what can be done here because we know what we used to have. And there would be a way of um, reconfiguring some of the things that seem to have, have um, uh, for one reason or another, uh, I, I was going to say gone astray, but it feels as though... Um, we've lost sight of the importance of a coordinated approach to internationalization. Now, you mentioned internationalization at home, and I do think that is critical. In the, when you think of the components that have to be kept together to be uh, a, an institution with international impact, they are obviously student mobility in both directions, research partnerships. But to your point, uh, what about, you know, even if we got really good at it and we had... 25% of our students all having an international experience by going abroad. 75% of the students need to be prepared to be actors on, on the global stage when they graduate. And just teaching them the way we have been doing is not, not going to cut it. We, may, we need to think. I mean, this is a global discussion, right? What does internationalization at home look like? How do disciplines have to change driven by that goal? of producing uh, graduates who have the skills and capacity to do the work they're going to do effectively in a global context. So um, here's sort of where we are. I mean, my, my, the conversation is an open-ended thing. We are talking about all these, these topics, but we can't wait until we get to the end of the conversation to take some action. So, uh, um, there is already uh, uh, planning going underway to produce kind of a working group to think about what the bits and pieces are that need to be brought together, what it should look like, uh, before we get to the point of saying, well, here's the next strategy. And the next strategy needs to be much more um, ambitious than the one that is ending right now. Um, uh, it needs to be... Um, I think not only ambitious, but more fully integrated with the overall direction of the university and its goals. Yeah, please. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just uh, nursing a little cough. Um, my name is Mofi. I work at the School of Business. And just to add to the piece on international at home, I, I, I want to also emphasize the importance of thinking about how we create space for the voices and the experiences of degree-seeking international students on this campus and dedication to providing resources and services. And, and in addition to that culture change, also a culture change on the perceptions of international student at Queens. So I've worked in many capacities at the International Center and Faculty of Engineering as well, working with international students. And that would be my takeaway also considering how as a campus we react to the international students on this campus, the knowledge that they bring in, the expertise that they bring in as well, uh, when talking about international at home as yeah. well. And um, there's another piece I wanted to quickly touch on when we talk about even the international student uh, population, what is that diversity within that population? And um, I, I had the opportunity to attend a lunch with um, international high school um, advisors, and I was on a table with a couple of uh, advisors coming from different parts of Africa. And one of the things they said to me was, Queens doesn't care about us. We don't hear anything from Queens in, in the, con the continent. Mm. And for me, as a black person, as a former international student from Nigeria, and working with many other international students, it's, it's kind of disheartening for students to work with students that feel like this, this university isn't seeking them out. And they have to, they have to seek themselves to be here. And, and so, so that's, that's, kind of my, that's kind of my perspective when, when we think of international at home as well. It's a really valuable perspective, thanks. Um, I, I mean, 
if I could go to your, your, your second observation, uh, yes, absolutely true. We have to be thoughtful about where we would like to see students come from, and we need to have a very broad approach to the world here. So at the moment, we're very concentrated in a very small few parts of the world in terms of the student body. So all students, international students, need to feel welcomed, valued, and engaged with uh, when they come. And as, as you say, if, if in certain parts of the world people figure, well, you know, Queens is, you couldn't care less whether you come or you don't, um, that's hugely problematic. And I actually, sub-Saharan Africa is the glaring, the glaring uh, absence in our, in our thinking about these things. So um, the, the working group that, that will be put together to look at this will have to think about how we, how we understand our relationship to the whole of the globe. And you know, we, don't, we don't want to, in fact, just be the victim of current geopolitical currents and, and the desires out there. We need to actually be thoughtful about what kind of international community we want to make here and who is in it. Uh, your, your, uh, your first point, I thought, was also a really important one, too, about how, how international students experience life here. Um, there have been some very alarming, alarming statistics you know, in, out in recent years, for example, about how many international students leave this country able to say they made a Canadian friend. It's an appalling figure. I can't remember one point something percent, uh, e extraordinary. And, and also, when asked, you know, to what extent were you engaged with uh, in recognition of your, your, the perspective you might bring uh, to the material in the classroom, most students say not at all. Uh, that's across the country, not, not just in our institutions. So uh, all the issues you've raised are really important. And of course, they intersect too with our equity, diversity, and inclusion issues on, on this campus. Um, so um, yeah, a, a proper international strategy will have to attend very explicitly to the, the issues you've raised. Yes, please. Uh, I have a Queen's BA, I have Queen's PhD, I've worked in, for 20 years in online education, and I'm just wondering when is Queen's going to get uh, Queen's Online, because that is a step in your uh, aspiration to internationalize, and it would help you with uh, sustainable development goals and the Right to Education initiative, which requires um, for there to be quality education, which Queen's is always all about, to uh, adopt availability, um, accessibility, acceptability, and adaptability as the four cornerstones of the right to education. And if Queen's started to use that language of the right to education adopted by UNESCO, you would have the language you need in order to reach further, do more, and so uh, I would think that you should start talking to Queen's graduates who are working in, in um, distance education because we actually know how to do it. And it's the 21st century and you're talking about things that are sort of a little bit old school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's, let, let's push the envelope a little bit. Online education is where it's at. You'll get all kinds of... Um, Kudos for it. Queen's has a national and international reputation. You just have to get those students to come back and be online. Thank you. Um, before you give up the mic, can I just ask, um, so just because I'm new com having come back, so w what has been the level of discussion about our online activity over the years? Here? I teach your students. <laughs> I, I teach for Athabasca University. I te teach a lot of visiting students. I teach the older demographic, the people who cannot leave uh, Renfrew or um, mm. who, who have taken some Queen's online courses but can't get the courses that they want. And so they come and take the courses from us because our enrollment starts at the first of every month. And in the next couple of years, it'll probably change so that it'll be, you know, as soon as you enroll, yeah. you can start the course. And that really does speak to people's motivation. And there are many people who can't pick up and move. 
so we have to go to where they are. And that would be such a much better way of serving the corridor that you're talking about. Mm. And those who can, can come and they can do short-term courses at Hearst Monceau or at Queen's, they'd love it. But you also have to serve those unemployed Calgarians who uh, yeah. you know, have their first degree but who are never invited back. So if you took all of the Queen's grads and after 10 years invited them to do a master's at Queen's for those who haven't gone out and got one, my goodness, you'd know that they had a good basic education and you'd have um, you know, chatter about how wonderful Queen's is all over the country again. Yeah. Thanks. A really interesting suggestion. I especially liked um, the point you made about the SDGs and the whole question of, uh, I mean, online education as a force for global development, a really important consideration. Um, because as part of this conversation, I mean, I'm asking the question, what's the impact of this place? I mean, the, we're not having a conversation about just keeping going. You know, uh, our, our existence has to be vindicated in some way by an impact. Um, so there's an interesting way of opening on to the question of global social impact. And when I came to Queens, I came from Saskatoon because of a high school teacher. And that high school teacher has retired to uh, Kingston. And whenever I come to Kingston, I visit him because oh. I'm so grateful that he sent me in this direction. So part of it is, you know, just you have to know what you've got in the brand, but, and you have to cultivate it, but you're sort of losing your way yeah. because um, I think it's the, you're an insecurity around the research piece. Uh, when I did my first degree, Queen's was an undergraduate uh, institution and quite proud of it. Um, and, and it's fine, yes, we, we, we want to be in the U15, but at the same time, it starts with the undergraduates. Thank you, thank you. Yes, please. I just wanted to add to um, this lady's comments because I, uh, I just actually took a different job at Queen's, but it's the six years prior to me uh, being in this job, I was the academic advisor for our online students doing art, arts and science online courses. And in the first term that I started that job, I had about 180 students. In the last term before I left that job, we had 1,300 in one semester. Hmm. So it's a very high number of students that are being exposed to the Queen's undergraduate online experience. And as I got to know them and we, we started doing some demographic and psychographic research, we realized that these are students who would not have an, any other opportunity to pursue an undergraduate education because they are people who are working parents, uh, they might be running a business. It's just not a time in their life that they can drop everything and you know, pick up and do an undergraduate degree. So supporting that I think would help um, position Queens to be in a place where we could really enable the education and the betterment and the transformation of these people who, as I said, would not normally be able to have access to this education. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Um, to continue the train of thought as well, one of the things that I've never understood with universities is why when they graduate, your relationship is done, aside from, for lack of better terms, asking to open up the wallet and make contributions. A nice online platform would allow you to continue a relationship with students. Honestly, after somebody's been gone for three, four years, why not allow them to take some basic course, some components for their own upgrading or badging or whatnot, so they stay within the community. The, the conversation continues, the yeah. relationship continues. Thanks. You know, at, at the last session, someone proposed the analogy of a club, you know, that when you, when you graduate from the university, you remain a member of this club, for, you know, for which there would be some privileges. And the part of that would be on the, the capacity for on, you know, ongoing education throughout the lifespan. I, I mean, I, we do have to think about that. Um, because I, I'm, we, you, know, you probably know we just signed this Magna Carta Declaration. And I'm on the group that's rewriting the Declaration for the next 30 years. And one, one of the elements being incorporated in this account of what universities 
should be for the 21st century, is that idea, which is that education doesn't end uh, because of the whole question of people having to retool for different jobs all the time. It's, it's going to happen. So universities need to adapt to that, that concept of, of playing an ongoing role in people's lives uh, as, as their, their work situations change. So I'm mindful of the fact that we're almost out of time, but there is a few minutes. So any, anyone else want to raise an issue that we haven't gotten to or amplify something we've discussed? Yes, please. Um, Laura Murray in English and Cultural Studies. There are many ideas I have floating in my head, but um, on this question of access, um, something that I've recently encountered is the fact that if you live in Kingston but have never been enrolled at Queen's and you want to take a single course out of interest here and the professor is okay with it, you're not allowed. You can only take an online course in arts and science if you haven't been a Queen's student before. And um, so I think that this access question goes to the, both the local and the global level. And um, so while I love the idea of you know, drawing alumni in for courses, I also think that it's quite unconscionable that we're not open to what we used to call mature students or people who, you know, like the online students, maybe they have time, they live around here, they can take one course, or they're experimenting, maybe they'll go back, they need to try it out. Um, that, this is ridiculous to me. Um, I tend to be quite locally oriented in my research, and I think that the regional and international actually provide quite a, a useful dual way of you know, anchoring and positioning ourselves. One of the things I was thinking when you were talking about the regional efforts, this 401 um, mm -hmm. uh, idea, I know that um, there was an organization, and Susan Lord had a, a grant for a while, called Corridor Culture, and it was based on the fact that people are always traveling from Montreal to Toronto, and maybe they need to stop in the middle and do something here. Yep. And I, I don't know if that's still going on, but it was partly just strategic, but it's also a way of thinking of this as actually being the fulcrum of yes. these communication routes. From my research, I also think that we could think about the treaty area as a possible way of, of thinking about our, our range of conversations and partnerships. So the Crawford Purchase Treaty basically goes from Mallory Town to, well, either the Bay of Quinte or Coburg or whatever, but you know, the southern, the northern shore of Lake Ontario. Um, and um, uh, relationships with Mississauga people um, and Haudenosaunee people um, really ought to go beyond the land acknowledgement. We could think about the kinds of relationships that we could develop, both for research and teaching, and I think they can complement each other. Um, so those are, there you go, both international relationships and local relationships. And um, I, I'm, I'm excited to think about the ways that we could develop that further. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. And, and all that comes together under the heading of impact, right? So the big question we want to ask is, what, what sort of impact do we want this place to have? And you know, a strategic plan that says we want a certain kind of international profile in research is, to me, a hopelessly abstract goal. Uh, to say this institution is going to mobilize its resources for the transformation of this region, socially, culturally, and economically, and through doing that, have its global impact, because these things are continuous. To me, that's an exciting way of talking about impact. Um, not just suggesting we want to achieve a certain level of prominence, which is sort of, to me, an odd goal. Um, so I welcome what you say, because I, I think um, it's um, what, what's going to get us all up in the morning to come to work. It's about knowing that impact that's human, that's transformative, and that is local to us. So. Uh, I'm hoping there'll be much more talk of that sort as this conversation progresses, because um, uh, that's part of being bold. Um, not saying we're here just to uphold our tradition. We have to actually do something bigger. Um, I know the weather's getting bad, so you, 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 you probably want to head off. Thanks very much, everyone. And I hope you'll come out for the next ones. And uh, thank you.